today is all about victory. We're not going to talk about politics. We're not going to talk about all the negative stuff that we see on the news or on anything else. I want to talk about victory. And uh, Pastor Dennis invited me to do a sermon about one of my favorite psalms. And I went and I looked through, and there's a lot of great psalms out there. We're going to do Psalm 21 today. So if you want to start flipping there, we'll get there in just a second. But uh, I was looking through. Psalm 134 is one of my favorites. It's about... uh, Midnight shift workers praising God because, well, I've worked midnights for many years, so that's something near and dear to my heart. And then Psalm 22 is another one that I really, really love. In Psalm 22, King David predicts the crucifixion accurately, I might add, about a thousand years before Christ is ever even born. Crucifixion wasn't even a thing until the Roman Empire, so it's about 700 years out from that. And about a thousand years away, the Israelites, the Hebrews, are singing this psalm about the Savior who is killed on the cross. They talk about how they gamble for his clothes. The Spirit even mentions Jesus' last words. Anybody that doesn't think that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, read that. It'll send chills up your spine. It's one of my favorites. But as I was looking through all these different passages, I came across Psalm 21, and it's one of those ones that just reached out to me and, and grabbed me. I thought, oh, that's awesome. I absolutely love this psalm. Because it's the story of King David and how he details victory. Now, King David, by any measure, had a rough life. He went through, in in his early childhood years, his brothers and sisters laughed at him when he had dreams. He was a shepherd, got attacked by wild animals. He was anointed king and then had to battle a giant. Then he went on to be a servant to the current king who became jealous of him and tried to kill him many times, chased him into the wilderness. Once he himself became king of Israel, he was attacked by nations all around him, constantly at at, uh, battle. He made mistakes in his life. It's one good thing I, I think about the Bible, that it shows both the good and the bad. No other holy book is like this. No other book from history shows this much detail about the lives of the people involved. Even though King David was a hero of faith, it clearly details when he messed up, when he made major mistakes. We all make mistakes. And in this psalm, King David even mentions God's unfailing love for us. Though we may stumble, though we may fall, God will pick us back up. He's still there with us. He still loves us. We're still his children. I think it's awesome to note that it shows realistic people in real situations. And King David puts that in there. Later on, King David's own son, Absalom, chases him into the wilderness with an army and tries to kill him. I mean, this is not a guy who had an easy life. He was not somebody that sat there on the sidelines with his feet up and just was able to relax. He was a guy who had to fight every step of the way. And God used his struggles for glory. We're still reading the book. We're still reading King David's stories today. So whatever struggle you're going through, you need to praise God before the battle, during the battle, and after the battle. For me and myself, my own battles, I don't like battles that continue on forever. I don't mind being in a battle, and I've always had that love for the warrior spirit, somebody who can take difficulties and pick themselves back up, dust themselves off, and say, you know what, I'm going to continue despite having things being difficult for me. However, it's not easy to do, and I want my battle to be over. I want to see an end. Unfortunately for some of us, the light at the end of the tunnel is far away. You might not even see the light at the end of your tunnel. But you know what? Praise God through that battle, because he can take that and turn that into a victory. He can use that. Think about it. We're still talking about King David. And throughout King David's life, the the light at the end of that tunnel was still a long ways off throughout his entire life. So if we look at Psalm 21, I'm going to read through it real quick. It's a bit of poetry here from the Hebrew words. It starts out with praise for God and it ends with praise for God, kind of like a bookend. And in the middle, King David gives the reasons that he praises God through all this difficulty. It reads, The king rejoices in your strength, O Lord. How great is the joy in your victories or salvation you give. You have granted him his heart's desire. You have not withheld the request from his lips. 
you came to greet him with rich blessings and place a crown of pure gold on his head. And we're going to get into the crown of pure gold here in just a moment because that's talking about something specific. He asked for your life, he asked you for life and you gave it to him. The length of his days forever and ever. Maybe that's talking about uh, eternal life, just a preview of what's to come. Through his victories, his glory is great. You have blessed him with splendor and majesty. Surely you have granted him unending blessings. Again, talking about what's to come, our eternal glory with God. You made him glad with the joy of your presence. For the, the king trusts in the Lord. Through his unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Unending love. Like I was telling you, even though we might stumble, even though we might fall, God still gives us that unending love. We're his children. Yeah, we might mess up from time to time, but God still has you. And it's important sometimes when we have the wrong view of the world, sometimes when we have the wrong outlook, the wrong worldview, that somebody steps into our lives and corrects our worldview and that we repent and we go back to God, but God still has that unfailing love for us. He goes on to talk about God's strength and power here in verse number eight. It says, your hand will lay hold of your enemies. With your right hand, you will seize your foes. Keep in mind who's at the right hand of the Father. Could this be talking about Jesus coming back to make things right? When you appear for battle, you will burn them up as, in a, as if in a blazing furnace. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and his fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, their posterity from mankind. Though they plot evil against you, talking about against God, and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. God is all-powerful. He's our all-powerful God. He's the Almighty. You will make them turn their backs as you draw your bow down upon them. And then the last verse ends in 13 with that other bookend of praise. Thanking God for all these blessings that, he, that he's uh, given. Be exalted in your strength, O Lord. We will sing and praise your might. We, not I, but we. Why does King David keep using we? Because together we're much stronger. By ourselves, just singular, we can be strong, sure. But together, as a congregation, we're like a family. We're the body of Christ. We sit down together and we worship together and we love together. We hear each other's stories. We uplift each other when we're going through those trials, through those difficulties. But singular is much easier to tear down. Together, we're much stronger. And that's why God put us together. <clears throat> the enemy will try to attack. And, and I'm not actually going to use a Bible for this demonstration. I grabbed a book, that, uh, like a phone book. Uh, <laughs> the enemy tries to attack the Bible. If we look at a book, pages of the book are strong. It's difficult to tear and rip. I'm sure some people can do it. I'm not going to try. <laughs> However, a book is actually strong. Pages of the book together can form a very strong object. Believe it or not, it can actually stop a bullet. During the Virginia Tech shootings, which were horrible, one student got shot in the backpack as he was running away. He didn't realize it until he got home and flipped his backpack around and realized there was a hole in the backpack and that one of his textbooks stopped the bullet. Together, pages of the book are very strong. It's actually accurate. I tested this theory one time, and sure enough, a book will stop a bullet. Altogether, the Bible is strong. It's the inerrant word of God. Satan doesn't try to just come out generally and say, oh, that's just all false. He tries to take one part of it because one page is much more easy to tear, rip apart than it is the entirety of the book. Together, the book is strong, but just like that, we together are much stronger as well. We can look to each other in times of difficulty in times of hardship, and we can uplift each other and glorify each other. So why does King David praise God? Well, he gives us the reason to praise God, and he starts out in verse 1. Lord, in your strength, strength the king rejoices, 
and in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. God doesn't want us to be alone. He doesn't want us to be without him. We are made to have a spot in our heart for God. We are made to have his vision. Throughout the psalm, King David talks about how he takes on his enemies. Because King David had a heart for God, his enemies were also God's enemies. It wasn't his opinion, his personal opinion. We all have personal opinions, sure. But God gives us the reasons why we like or dislike certain things. If God created the entire world and God created all of us, his Bible, his book of life, might have some things in it that we might want to understand, we might want to take to heart. There's a reason he gave us the morals he did, the, and we should follow them. God is going to support them. Secondly, God gives us victory against his enemies, and he honors those who put their trust in him. In the fifth verse, it says, His glory is great through your salvation and splendor and majesty he bestows upon him. So what if you don't have God's vision? What if your vision is skewed? What if you don't have the right idea? Well, King David, when he met Bathsheba, he committed egregious sin. He looked at Bathsheba with lust. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He invited her husband to his house and then later had him killed, Uriah the Hittite. That's pretty bad. Murder and uh, adultery, just uh, little things, you know. I always feel bad for Uriah. He seems like such a good guy, you know. He's, he's such an honorable dude that even when he comes to the king's house, he sleeps outside instead of sleeping inside because all, all my other men are sleeping outside, so I might as well sleep outside too. However, even though his life was cut short there, really throughout the whole Bible, there's only one grave that's empty. That's Jesus's. King David's grave is not empty. Anybody else's grave is not empty. So even though Uriah's life was short, he still had a part to play. And uh, King David didn't quite recognize that at the time. His vision was skewed. He let little bits of sin come into his life and affect his being. Now, what happens when, when you let sin in, sometimes it will skew your outlook. You make excuses of why it's there. We don't want to do that. Now, I have a volunteer coming up. Nate, you want to come on up? I promise you, I have not told Nate what I'm going to do yet. I swear. Why don't you come over here, Nate? So, how is your eyesight, Nate? Uh, well, I'm wearing glasses, so probably not so great. <laughs> <laughs> with, with your glasses, can you read uh, stuff pretty well, would you say? Yeah, I could say pretty yeah, well, yeah. About 2020-ish? 20, yeah, about, yeah. yeah. So, could you read what's on that screen, the top line there for me? Sure. We have a reason to praise God. Okay. Amen. So, do me a favor. Take off your glasses, would you please? Aye, aye. If you don't mind just putting those down, you can. I won't touch them, I promise. These are a pair of my prescription sunglasses. So, they're adjusted to my eyes, not Nate's eyes. Why don't you put those uh, prescription glasses on there for me, Nate? Thank you, sir. Sure. Appreciate you. How, how can you see with those on now? Well, I probably look pretty cool. But, <laughs> and, well, I can kind of still see the words, but it's very, very blurred. It's very blurred. It's not quite as easy to see those words. Now, go ahead and stand right there. I'm going to have you face me this direction here. I want to make sure you don't fall, because um, those are probably pretty strong glasses. <laughs> but I'm going to grab something over here, and it got moved. But... All right, I'm going to hold this up so the rest of the congregation can see what this is. Don't tell him. Don't tell him going to be a secret. I'm going to throw, him at, throw it at him. He's got to catch it. And Nate, can you tell me what's in my hand? Scientifically something solid. <laughs> Just guessing. Why don't you go ahead and put your regular glasses back on and take a look at what I've got in my hand here. <laughs> Probably not something that you want thrown at you uh, <laughs> without knowing it's coming at you. Nate, let's give Nate a big round of applause. We appreciate you being there. You can leave that stuff there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the worldview that is what we see the world through. They're like the spectacles that focus our vision. Satan tries to attack by changing our worldview and making you think that wrong is right and right is wrong. It attacks the little pages of the Bible, the little things. 
and it starts small like yeast, growing in the dark and exploding into the light. That's what happened to King David here with Bathsheba. One little thing became the next thing, became the next thing. One lie became adultery, which became murder. And it took his priest coming in and giving him a story about somebody else doing something bad and him getting very angry. Why would this person do something bad? And then the priest looked at him and said, that's you. It took that for King David to look and go, wow, I really messed up. I stumbled, I fell. That's not supposed to be me. I'm supposed to be better than that. It's a great story because it doesn't put David in a perfect light all the time. Like I said, there's no other holy book like that that takes real people in real places and tells their true story of how they can get so messed up. And when we put on the wrong glasses, we don't see the world in the correct light. We don't see the danger that's coming. If you walked up down the road and you saw some angry guy holding a big rock, that'd probably be a big clue, a big red flag to not walk into that situation. But when you're wearing the wrong glasses, when you have the wrong worldview, you don't see the danger coming. You're about to get hit by a train, you can't tell. Like uh, Pastor Dennis said a couple weeks ago, he talked about freedom from sin and how God gives us that freedom. And Satan tries to take that word freedom and skew it just a little bit and say, well, if you're free, why not indulge in the, the flesh? Why not indulge in this, indulge in that? But just like that, a train off the tracks isn't freed from the tracks. It's called a train wreck. A boat out of the water is not a freed boat. It's a ship aground. We all have a place to be, and God keeps us safe. Just like little children, when they go up and grab that pot of boiling hot water, that's not freedom. That's danger. you got to look out for that stuff. That's why God gives us his book, his book of truth, because we can be free from sin, from evil, from danger. And Satan tries to attack those little things to just tell you, oh, you know, just a little bit's okay. Just a little bit's okay. And next thing you know, it's adultery and murder. Hopefully not in your situation, but sometimes people get skewed a little bit. Their vision gets off, and they need the help of somebody else. That's why it's so important together to have somebody with you, to have somebody you can talk to, to be accountable to, so that way you can see when you're starting to go a little bit astray. David thanks God that even though he stumbled, even though he fell, God still had that unending love forever and ever for him. He wasn't doomed because he made some pretty bad choices. He was able to pick himself back up and got, he still praised God for that. Now we want to praise God before, during, and after each battle. How many of you praise God during a battle? It's pretty easy to praise God when we have everything going for us. We got that new job, that new car, you know, things went great at work today. Your boss said, hey, good job. It's pretty, pretty easy to praise God and thank him. Oh, man, that was great. What a, what a fantastic day. But how many of you praise God honestly when you have a bad health report, when you lose your job? when things are not going your way. Because there's one thing that you can be sure in life, and that's there's going to be downtimes. I don't care how great our economy is, how great our world is, things are still not going to go perfectly your way all the time. But God can use those situations and tell your story and make it glorified. Through King David's battles, he fought one of these smaller nations known as the Ammonites. They were one of God's enemies. They were a pagan nation. And like many other pagan nations, they did some pretty bad things. And God told King David to go to battle. Don't let them wipe you out. And King David took it upon himself, and him and his armies wiped out the Ammonites. Afterwards, his men took the crown from their king and put it on King David's head. That may be what King David was talking about in this particular psalm when he said, you've taken your crown and placed it on my head. The king 
didn't want his vision to interrupt it. Sure, he could have done what so many kings before him did. King Saul, just before him, was told to go to war. And when he went to war, he didn't follow God's instructions. He let evil survive and continue to thrive. King David followed the instructions and God glorified him. The Old Testament is filled with nations that we don't talk about anymore, we don't hear about anymore. Assyria, there's many others. Why are they in there? Well, because they turned from God. Sometimes what we have to do is not easy, it's not nice, it's not easy to walk away from sin. Sin is fun, it's exciting. Satan likes to play on that, just like in the Garden of Eden when Satan comes up and tries to play on, oh, it's okay. It's fun, it's nice, but you can't give in to that. You have to do what God tells you to do because then if you don't and you let sin have a foothold in your life, your vision gets skewed and you can't see. You don't see the danger coming. God gives us glory. He gives us victory. God gave us his only son to die up on a cross, just like that song that Amy just sang, told us about. I love that song, by the way. It's awesome. I can't imagine what that had to be like. I really can't. But he gave us that so we could have victory. That anybody that believes in him, that has faith in Jesus, can have never-ending life. He's taken our sins. He's taken our wrongdoings. We may stumble, we may fall, but guess what? God has already taken the payment for that. Thank God. I'm so happy that, that he's made those sacrifices for me. He's made those sacrifices for all of you as well. If you don't yet trust God as your Savior and you want to know where you're headed, when your life ends, just like all the people in the Bible's life has ended, and you have to give an account for your life, I want you to know. I want you to be sure of where you're headed, where you're going. I don't want you to be worried. I'm not worried. I don't want you to be either. I believe if you pray to God and say, take my sins, Lord, I put my belief, my faith, my trust in you, that you have that never-ending life, those blessings forever and ever that David talks about, that you don't have to have eternal fire that David talks about, that you're not one of the people that God's right hand comes against, but somebody that God's presence comes to be with. And that's what victory is. That's what victory is in this psalm, and that's what victory is for all of us, because our lives are short. We'd like to say that we live long lives, but just like all these heroes of faith in the Bible, our lives are short. And one day we're going to have to come to our Maker and give an account for who we are and what we've done. And instead of giving an account for all the stumbles, all the falls that we've had, Jesus takes our place. And he said, this is the person that this is. Because he believed in me, I took that place. So in closing, I'd like to say a prayer. If everybody bow their heads, Lord Jesus, we thank you for giving us victory. We thank you for giving us victory in you. Lord, you are the Almighty. You can take any situation for good. You can change it and make the difficult be victories. You can make the downtrodden a success. You can make all of us victorious in your name. Lord, if anybody here or online does not believe in you, Lord, I pray that they pray, pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I put my faith, my trust in you. I believe you died on that cross and rose from the dead in three days and that you've taken my penalty, my sin, my stumblings, my dishonor, and turned them into honor, Lord. When I face you one day after my life is over, I want it to be because you gave me eternal life and glory. I want you to sit back and say that you are the one that took all my payment of guilt and sin. Lord, if you've prayed that prayer, if anybody here has prayed that prayer, if anybody online has prayed that prayer, we know that they can have eternal victory. They don't have to worry or fret anymore. Lord, we love you. We praise your name. Help guide us this coming week. 
Help us do the right things. Help us have the correct worldview, the correct vision to see when danger comes and when good comes. Help us unite together as a congregation so that way we are strong, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for all your blessings and your honor and your glory. Amen.